For the first time ever, the CSIRO has estimated what large-scale nuclear plants would cost in Australia. They want you to believe that nuclear is double the price of wind and solar, but we did the maths and nuclear is officially back in the game. The CSIRO recently released their final version of this year's Gen Cost Report, which estimates the cost an investor would face for different generation technologies, including wind, solar, gas, coal, and nuclear. After only including small modular reactors for the past several years and excluding large scale nuclear from their analysis, the CSIRO finally decided to estimate large scale costs too. Now, the Gen Cost authors do deserve credit for listening to feedback and fixing this glaring omission. But did they fix all the issues with their nuclear analysis? Let's dive in. Here you can see the cost estimates for large-scale nuclear versus firmed renewables. This is where all the headline writers find the soundbite that nuclear is double the price of wind and solar. But fixing just three of the unrealistic assumptions in the gen cost model reveals that nuclear is easily cost competitive with renewables. Number one. GenCost assumes an economic life of 30 years for nuclear plants. However, new nuclear reactors around the world are being built to last for 60 to 100 years. Number two, GenCost assumes a capacity factor of 53 to 89% for nuclear plants. This is very low. The US nuclear fleet averaged 93% over the last two years, and that was using reactors built in the 70s and 80s. Number three, the GenCost model locks in a uranium price spike of $1.10 to $1.30 per gigajoule resulting from the recent US ban on Russian fuel for the entire life of a nuclear plant. This is despite GenCost itself projecting uranium prices will come back down to between $0.80 cents and $1 per gigajoule by 2030. Thankfully, because uranium is still a cheap fuel, this assumption has less of an impact than the previous two factors. Fixing these three misguided assumptions about the economic life, capacity factor, and fuel cost of nuclear reactors puts the actual cost estimate smack bang in the range of firmed renewables. So there you have it. Nuclear is cost competitive with wind and solar after all. But wait, there's more. We've looked at GenCost's assumptions about nuclear, but what about renewables? Have the CSIRO accounted for all the transmission and storage that would be needed in their firmed renewables cost estimate? It's time to tally up the costs of the currently planned pumped hydro and transmission projects in the national electricity market. First up, we have Snowy 2.0 at $12 billion, Pioneer Burdekin also at $12 billion, and Barumba at $14.2 billion. None of these pumped hydro projects will produce any electricity. They'll only store it to firm intermittent wind and solar. Building all this will cost consumers a total of $38.2 billion. Now onto transmission. We got VNI West at $4 billion, Humelink at $4.9 billion. Then to support renewable energy zones, we've got Central West Arana at $3.2 billion and New England at $3.7 billion. Sydney Ring is another $2.5 billion, with the Gladstone Grid reinforcement being $1.3 billion, Queensland Supergrid South $3.3 billion, Copper String another $5 billion, and to cap it all off, Project Marinus coming in hot at $6.7 billion. Once again, none of these transmission projects produce any electricity, they're only being built to support intermittent renewables. And they come to a grand total of 34.6 billion. Added to pumped hydro, this is 72.8 billion of stuff that we're paying for which doesn't produce any electricity. Taking at face value GenCost's capital cost estimate of 8.7 billion to build a 1 gigawatt nuclear reactor, 72.8 billion is enough to buy 8 large scale nuclear reactors. Instead of building all of these transmission and pumped hydro projects that produce zero electricity, we could be building 8 gigawatts of 24-7 cheap, clean and reliable nuclear power. And this $72.8 billion figure doesn't even include the wind turbines and solar panels themselves, or the long list of battery projects currently underway, or the future transmission and storage projects that a renewables dominated grid will need. Let's see what happens if we add in just one chunk of all those extra costs. Using GenCost's prices, we estimated the cost of all the consumer batteries we'd need to support the grid by 2050 according to the integrated system plan. You can see how we calculated that in this video, link below. The total comes to a whopping $229 billion. None of these home batteries will produce any electricity, they only store it to help firm intermittent renewables. 
And if we add that cost to the total cost of the transmission and pumped hydro being built, we get an eye-watering $301.8 billion. That's enough to buy 35 one gigawatt nuclear reactors. To put this in perspective, the peak demand for the entire national electricity market in 2024 was 38 gigawatts. This means for the price we're paying just to support intermittent wind and solar, we could afford to build even a 90% nuclear grid that is cheap, clean and reliable. It's about time the Albanese government and anti-nuclear advocates face up to the truth. Nuclear power is not exorbitantly expensive, especially when we consider how much consumers are paying and will continue to pay to support intermittent renewables.